Hi everyone, my name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for July 26, 2013. This week, we've got uh, observations of uh, asteroid 2003 DZ-15, or DZ-15, if that doesn't make any sense. Um, update on Comet Ison, uh, the Cosmos trailer, uh, mm. the Did You Smile at Saturn, Pale Blue Dot, version 2, uh, the astrological sign of the royal baby. Uh, the upcoming Delta Aquarius meteor shower. Uh, and if we have time, we're going to talk about Apollo 11, uh, the updated status on Kepler, and the Curiosity rover. So, joining me this week, a ragtag crew of uh, space astronomy journalists. We've got got David Dickinson, who who is the uh, astro guys. <laughs> We've got. Uh, We've got Jason Major. Lights in the dark. He's rocking out, partying. Uh, and we've got Scott Lewis, hey. a.k.a. AKA Know the Cosmos. Uh, okay, so first, uh, David, you, you know what? You have got a strange name this week. You're, you're the very yeah, bad astrologer. Yeah. yeah so that. I think, you know what? I'm going to throw that just to the top of the queue right now. Okay. We'll get, we'll get this right over with. So, yes, so why are you the, calling yourself the bad the, astrologer? The, the royal baby news has spilled over to Universe Today. Actually, it was due to an article that I wrote over at uh, Canada.com that went out on syndication through a lot of astrology sites and perturbed a few astrologers when I pointed out that due to the precession of the equinoxes, Although the, the date of what the astrologers will call the cusp of Leo when uh, the was uh, July 22nd, I believe it was. I'm the bad astrologer, so I don't really know. But just make it up. Was, uh, yeah, I'm just making it up, yeah. basically. It's like, <laughs> I was like, you know, astronomically, when you look at evidence-based science, if you're looking at the direction of where the sun is currently due to the precession of the equinoxes, it's still in the constellation Cancer. Now, I'm born in July, too, in late July, so that also means all us Leos that we've been told we're Leos all our life at the end of, Ju uh, at the end of July that are born were actually Cancers. Not that it really Wait, they're matters, lying to so. us? <laughs> I know, it's no. a big conspiracy. <laughs> it's, uh, and I got, I got a lot of mail. I got a few uh, encouraging ones that were like, bravo for taking down astrology, and I got a lot that were saying, well, you're confusing houses and signs and constellations and things like that, and I'm like, you know, a house to an astronomer is somewhere you live. A sign is something you see alongside of the road. They don't. <laughs> astronomers aren't at observatories talking about this stuff, like saying, "I wonder what house Mars is in tonight" or stuff like that. Constellations, again, are man-made things like political map boundaries and things like that. But there are at least things you can go in the night sky and see these patterns as we see from the Earth. So it was an interesting way. Yeah, on our uh, uh, wildly popular Phases of the Moon app, uh, we actually do <laughs> list the constellation that the Moon is in. Yeah. And I get all kinds of crap from people because they're like, you know, why are you buying into that astrological nonsense? I'm like, no, 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 the moon <laughs> is currently to, in a constellation yeah, right yeah. now. Yeah, to say the moon is in the direction of Leo is astronomy. To say that the moon in the direction of Leo is going to influence your love life or whether you're going to get a job, that's astrology. Right. So, wait, wait, still let me write that down. <laughs> so, so is this a kind of an astrological mistake that a lot of people are making now? I mean, it is well. Well, what they do is in astrology, they're going by the the sole position of the sun along the ecliptic. They're going by solar longitude. So they've basically done away with the precession of the equinoxes. That's the Earth's wobble that it does every twenty six thousand years. That's slowly making those constellations and signs go out of sync. They do it in a three hundred sixty degree circle. They divide it off into thirty degree, twelve thirty degree houses where astronomical constellations aren't divided that well. As a matter of fact, the sun goes through 13 constellations on, in astronomy, and the moon can, pe can be seen in 18 constellations, actually. It can wander uh, away from the ecliptic enough to be in Orion, Auriga, uh, Opiuchus, Opiuchus, however you want to say it. Uh, it can it can be in a lot of different constellations. So, yeah, there's definitely a, a growing discrepancy there. So, But that's exactly what a Leo would say. Yeah, I know it is. <laughs> but I'm not a Leo. I'm a Cancer. <laughs> I'm a Leo. <laughs> are so, you? Or maybe are you not. really though? I am, uh, well, <laughs> maybe. Lie about all these. And whether I'm on the cusp people. or I'm and, on. The, you, know, you know, we could we could do this all. The time. <laughs> it's it's ironic that had I had put the post over at Universe Today, I had pitched it to Nancy, but I think she was busy, so I'd written it and put it on Canada.com. Had I had put it on Universe Today, I probably would have got blowback 
from the other side. I would have got it from astronomers that are saying, why are you writing about this astrology stuff on Universe Today? It doesn't belong over here. So Some you know, people get really tied up <laughs> in terminology. Um, yeah. And, I mean, I, for, for anecdotally, one instance was I, I had gotten flack from one, um, you know, very loyal Universe Today reader because I used the term... Um, I use the term moon rise, you know, yeah, the moon, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. When, when the moon rises, and, and that was it. I mean, he didn't want to hear, you know, that or, type of terminology. Or, or conjunction or occultation, the word yeah, occult, I mean, occult. You know, when saying I, that when those, I, are, yeah. those are astrological terms and they, should be, and they should be stricken from the lexicon of astronomy forever, yeah. um, or, you know, and the, and the, 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 or, the pages well, salted the, and all this the, stuff. When the earth stops spinning, the moon will stop rising, and then mm -hmm. we'll be... Yeah, it's yeah. Gonna... Well, we get this controversy with the supermoon, too, right? Where yeah. people don't want us to use the term supermoon, and I'm like, we are taking it over. We are totally <laughs> using it, and anytime anyone wants to understand it, we're just going to do it from a scientific point of view. I actually wrote an article about the, the um, uh, Mercury in retrograde. Yeah, <laughs> and I just like completely scientific view of like observation, like what does it mean for Mercury to move in retrograde? Yeah, I, and then I in the very last that. sentence, I just said, oh, and all that astrological nonsense is you know complete. Well, nonsense. you know, Mercury spends about a third of its time in retrograde, so you're pretty safe to bl blame most of your problems on it. You've got about oh. a one out of three shot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> blame it on Mercury. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Good. Well, I'm really glad you took that flack, and I would have preferred you'd uh, had that hit Universe Today as opposed to Canada.com, but still, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> it was fun. It was interesting. Uh, well, let's let's keep talking. So let's talk about the Cosmos uh, trailer. Yes. So, you know, if anyone is, like, living under a rock, uh, they are remaking the Cosmos series. This is this famous, of course, Carl Sagan show that appeared in the 1970s and was seen by half a billion people, apparently. <laughs> I, I like um, the way you said billion there. Billion. Yeah, that was, a, that was a fill plate. That was a fill plate billion. Um and uh, yeah, billions upon trillions. Um, yeah, so so many people have have seen this show, and it's really like a. You talk to anybody, and it's just one of the most uh, influential pieces of media that they've seen, and you know that really, you know, influenced their interest in space and astronomy. I know it did for me. Uh, and so now they're remaking it again, and this time, of course. Neil deGrasse Tyson is going to be the host, and what's great is Seth MacFarlane is going to be what directing, producing it. It's going to be on Fox, which is kind of madness. So you know, we all saw the trailer. I yeah. think, I think, uh, I think that, it was that premiered it was... at uh, Comic Con. And uh, what do you guys think? It looked pretty good. I think it was Neil deGrasse Tyson. You were talking about it being on Fox. He was saying a lot. He got a lot of flack for that, and he said that's probably the audience that needs it the most. So <laughs> he's like, if we put it on PBS, well, it's, a, it's network plus television. It's, Fox is kind of, I mean, Fox and, and Seth MacFarlane, you know, they kind of go uh, hand in hand because of his yeah. success with Family Guy and and on all of his other shows, and you know, so it makes sense that that he would have partnered with Fox to get this thing distributed and and make it actually happen. Um, um, whether or not you know it, it's something that that you would expect to see on Fox is another story entirely. But um, you know, I saw it, and you know, I, I really want to love this show. I want to love this show oh, so yeah. badly. You know, I, I mean, uh, I, I I think McFarland's great. Uh, obviously, Neil deGrasse Tyson is is awesome. Space, Cosmos, Carl Sagan, all that stuff. I want to love this show so much. But the trailer made absolutely no sense to me. Right. I mean, I saw something that was just that, that was just this visual. I mean, there's, there's animation. I love animation. It was very designy. I like design. But I didn't get a sense of of what's going to happen in the show and how it's going to teach another generation about well, space. Well, if you go back to the original Cosmos, if you sort of see it, like the sort of the the theme of the whole show is that Carl Sagan is in this spaceship. And then he can use the spaceship to travel around the universe they have and the explore one. different mm -hmm. concepts. And so I think they've tried to keep that exact same theme. So now Neil deGrasse Tyson has got this rocket ship that he flies around in, and it can go backwards in time and forwards in time and travel to any 
point in the in the universe and to be able to view things visually and so that's what I think you're seeing is this you know you're seeing these the strange disjointed things as he's noodling around all of these different you know backwater areas of the universe to watch these big events unfold right so he's and, not just going to be narrating this you know these these scenes of, of space like say you know Mike Rowe does uh, on how the universe works or you know kind of or just wandering about on stage posing questions like Morgan Freeman does he's going to be Actively participating. He is in all piloting stuff. his little spaceship across the universe in space and time to watch these things happen live. Well, and I think Jason, you brought up a really good one about Mike Rowe and how the universe works. And I, when I saw the trailer, I'm seeing a lot of explosions and action. And if you've watched the original Cosmos, there's a little bit, but it's more of you are taking this journey along with it. You're not being dragged along. And I feel like there's a lot of push and action and playing to people with ADD, which is fine. <laughs> but Squirrel. I mean, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, I think that's great, but I also think it might be a little disheartening for some of us that really love the book and love the original series, which is going to happen. I mean, people are not going to love it anyway. But I, I'm worried that it's going to get lost in production and none of the heart of the original book is coming. I just hope it. it's cohesive. And, it, and it, yeah. I mean, you know, obviously... There's going to be hard science there, and there's you know the information will all be there. I just I just hope that it makes sense, and it's not so disjointed that it will only appeal to. I don't I don't know who I I guess it's supposed to appeal to everybody, and that's yeah. that can get a little tricky sometimes. So you know can can it get to out to that broadest audience and and you know be understood by everyone, but enjoyed by everyone as well. I, I, I mean I've spent the last 14 years of my life tackling this problem, right? Which yeah. is how do you how do you take an enthusiasm for something that is largely a very kind of intellectual thing? Like you're you know, we can't look at what these extrasolar planets really look like the way we can take pictures of sharks or take pictures of volcanoes. You know, we have to imagine these things. We have to explain them. We have to sort of convey how amazing and cool and interesting it is. And the only tool that you have is either the words and the concepts or visualizations of these things. So I think that that you know if those two can go hand in hand. I mean there's no question that that Neil deGrasse Tyson and you know can bring the science and can bring the concepts and sort of deliver that into this and you know from what I've seen of the graphics it's going to be stunning and I think I, I don't know I I think there's a real value to have having a big budget fresh graphics with that sort of, we sort of reimagining this thing that, that Carl Sagan did. I'm, you know, I'm. I watched it. and I was really excited. I gotta say, so I'm I, I not as watch, jaded. I still watch the old Cosmos out on Hulu and YouTube. You can still yeah. watch the episodes. And it's surprisingly still pretty topical. There's some discoveries that they they hadn't discovered extrasolar planets at that point, right. but they knew they were searching for them and stuff. And you know, I I learned about evolution from Cosmos. I didn't learn about it from school. Uh, I learned yeah. a lot of those concepts. So it's the first time I really got it is when I was watching Cosmos and stuff. You'd heard about it as a kid, but well, we, we Tyson talking... is a per Tyson's the perfect you know replacement. I hate to use that word, but he's he's the perfect next generation uh, Sagan. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. his delivery is is different, but but the the uh, poetic nature is there, and you know the enthusiasm is there, and so I mean he he is the perfect person to to have take it's... that role. It's going to be weird to see Cosmos with commercials. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's going to be a little strange. Yeah, I hope well, they put it online, too. Uh, well, there, I don't, it's going to be I, simulcast. They'll have it on yeah, Fox, and I, later it'll be on I, uh, Geographic, I think. I don't have a lot of us, so I don't have TV, so I may have to get cable just to see it. So. <laughs> my, my only concern is I think a lot of people are putting a lot of their hopes and dreams in the success of this. Like I think they're feeling like, finally, this is a legitimate... Uh, handling by Fox of this topic is very near and dear to us, but we're never going to see the kind of penetration that we did with the original Cosmos. I mean, that you know, half a billion people was you know was in a day when there wasn't a lot of good on television, and yeah, yeah. you know, you had four channels, and if you could watch this amazing, you know, people were f still kind of fresh from the moon landings. There was a lot of excitement. I think you know that was a that was a big deal, and now I think, you know, if we get if if, if we have a show that is pop as popular as say like the Blue Planet, or you know something like that, I think that'll be great. I think you know that that gets another year's worth, another another season. I think that's that would be fantastic. 
I, like, I, I know I'm setting my, my, my sort of expectations low, <laughs> but... <laughs> well, I, I think with the original Cosmos series, it was very intimate with the viewer. It was, you know, when you have, you know, Carl there, and he's, he's bringing you along in this journey, it's very intimate, and you feel like you have a patient instructor there with you the entire time, as he, opposed to someone throwing facts and jargon at you. He's with he you as a step of the way. Carl Sagan had a way of not talking down to you as much. I mean, so he drew in a lot of people that maybe weren't in the scientific realm as much, but they still found him fascinating. He, he really could cross over to a lot of other types of uh, interests. Right. And I think Neil deGrasse Tyson is the same. I mean, yeah. you know, when you see him riff... Like, the, the stuff that he is just riffing, we you know, I assume he's riffing. I don't know if he's prepared this for a talk on the, you know, on the Colbert Report. But, you know, <laughs> he just comes up with stuff that's like, like poetry coming out of his mouth. Like, it's amazing. So so I think he's he's the right guy for the job. Better him than me. <laughs> Although um, we're available. We're, yeah. we're, yeah. <laughs> we're available. If he can't show up, then any one of us would be glad to take his place. Um... All right, so let's talk about uh, 2003 DZ-15, David. Yes, Monday night we're going to have a pass by of a near-Earth asteroid, a moderately close pass. This is uh, 2003 DZ-15, was discovered in 2003. It is, oh, I got it written on my notes, it's Tunguska-sized, actually. It's about 150 meters in size. It's smaller than uh, 1998 QE2 that passed, actually a lot closer. This one's passing nine lunar distances away, and it's not going to be very bright. It's going to be about 14th magnitude. And the virtual telescope project is going to be running uh, a live ca uh, video cast of it Monday night starting at 22, 22 universal time, 6 p.m. Eastern time. They're going to run a broadcast on that. We actually ran an article in Universe today about where to see the, the broadcast of it. I talked to Sandy, who's usually here, about whether Arecibo is going to be pinging this one, and she said that when I talked to her a few days ago, there wasn't any plans. I saw some chatter on Twitter back and forth that maybe they might be going to ping it. She said it's a little small and far away for them to really go after, but uh, that may change come Monday. They may actually take a look at it. And like I said, this one I thought was interesting when I looked at the size of it. It, it is right about the size of the Tunguska impactor that, that hit in 1908, I think it was. I believe it was 1907, 1908. Just talking off the top of my head. June 30th, uh, 1908. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was in summertime. I remember reading that, so in 1908. This one is about that size. Of course, it's not going to impact, but it's always worth keeping an eye on these things. This is the closest pass, incidentally, this century for this asteroid. I, I, uh, I looked through an uh, a, a, a ephemeris generator and actually checked it out. It makes close passes of Venus, and it makes close passes of Earth kind of in a resonance right now. There's a pass nearly as close on February 12, 2057. If any of we're still doing a Google Plus Hangout by then, uh, we'll be talking about it again there in, in 2057. But uh, other than that, you know, it's, it's just worth keeping an eye on. There's, there's asteroids like this uh, about a dozen or so every year that come by. Uh, I, I get more interested when they come within the distance of the full moon or closer or if they get brighter than 10th magnitude. For me to try to look for them in my backyard, in Florida, in humid, uh, light polluted skies, it's going to be brighter than tenth magnitude for me to chase after it. Now, what I, house is it going to be coming through? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's funny how we've all gotten these have become very routine now, and yes. I think I you know I stop seeing the doomsday reports now, which that's I think that's interesting. Good. Yeah, so it, you know, in the room. past. You, when we got these close passes, people would freak out, and you know, I'd get lots of emails, and now nobody cares. You know, yeah, so we're, we're still we're, getting the emails for Ison, but uh, oh, oh, trust me. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. I'm getting yeah. the emails for Ison. <laughs> yeah, uh, Scott. Yeah, let's talk about Comet Ison then. Ison is awesome, and yes, there's so much going on where people are like, "It's going to hit us." It's actually this half the size of Jupiter, and NASA's lying. And Viru's trailing it. Right. <laughs> it, it's been kind of um, wonky out there. Um, but yesterday, um, Hubble, the, the team over at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and it was by Zolt Levy, released an image of Comet Ison from data taken in April. Of You're seeing the beautiful image, actually, let me share it out real quick, with the backdrop of some galaxies. So right here you're seeing a bunch of distance galaxies here with, with Ison here in the image, with obviously some stars going on. And it was taken with 
five separate images at two different filters, and over at uh, hubblesite.org, Zolt uh, Levy went on and shared how he processes these images and also um, gives the raw data so you can actually do them yourself. But I thought it was really a starking image because we typically think of a comet, you know, this icy, you know, rocky, dirty snowball in space, and you don't really think about anything like deep sky objects. So being able to see these amazing, brilliant galaxies immediately behind this pretty close object that's hurtling towards the sun, and hopefully it'll make it through so we can see it on its way back, was a really uh, great image. Uh, we went and shared it out there, but it's really cool being able to see the the magic on how these photos are being produced, that it's more of making sure that cosmic rays aren't messing up uh, your image coming through, so you're kind of having to patch with some good images going through and and some color balancing. But there's... So, you, so, you're, so you're saying NASA's photoshopping. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, they're taking the, the aliens out because <laughs> they don't, you know, that's... I've uh, so many of those comments lately, but um, we, Hubble, we are just buckle in, you know, because we are just getting started. Just getting yeah. started. And well, if it does flare up, oh man! <laughs> well, we've been doing hangouts with with Hubble. So last week we did um, Tony Darnell, Alberto Conti, and I. We hosted with a bunch of planetary astronomers talking about ISIN and what's what we're expecting to see, what we want it to see, you and. The consensus is we want to see it break up on its way away from the sun. So it'll be really pretty and you get to see all this great stuff. Um, it's not going to hit us. It's not going to hit us. <laughs> it, it's, people are still going to ask. People think it's, for some reason, half the size of Jupiter, which makes no sense. We're a small target. We really yeah. are. It's not going to hit us. I, I think I think people are getting they, they hear this term half the size of Jupiter because this happened with with other comets, Elena and all that other stuff. They hear oh, the no. size of the um of the what's the coma there, coma. Yep. you know. So they they hear that size and that actually is or the size of the tail and right. that actually is really big. I mean, you know, that does approach planetary sizes and beyond. Right. But there's nothing in there. You know, I mean, they don't realize that 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 the the stuff in I mean, the, uh, a comet's tail is more of a vacuum than we can create here on Earth in the best vacuum chambers that we have. I mean, there's really just yeah. nothing in that stuff. They give us so, a nice meteor shower when they happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah if we pass but through the tail, I still don't yeah. make it rain, and that's fine. I'm I'm, I'm okay <laughs> with that. We passed through the tail of Halley's comet in 1910, and that created a big stir because they had just discovered, uh, through spectroscopy, they had discovered uh, cyanogen gas cyanogen. in the tail. And uh, like Jason was saying, these these tails are so tenuous that I mean, the, the best vacuum on Earth, there's there's really no danger from it. But of course, with cyanide gas and things like that, people were afraid that they were selling comet pills and gas masks. And if you watch the original Cosmos, you can learn about that because it's in an episode of the original Cosmos. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so speaking of meteor showers, uh, David. Yeah, there's got there, there, uh, one there's a up. there's a, a, a major ish shower, not one of the best showers in the sky, but it's kind of a good uh, primer before the the big shower begins here in August. The Parisians, the 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 southern Delta Aquarids peak this weekend through the 28th through the 30th. This shower produces about a zenithal hourly rate of about 20 meteors. It's located the radiance located in Aquarius. And it's uh, one of the radiants that's actually better placed for Southern Hemisphere viewers. Now, I talked to a guy down in Argentina that I know that uh, does observations down there, and he said he's tried to watch the Delta Aquarids before. He thinks they're almost kind of mythical because he never seems to see a lot of them. But uh, it's it's uh, over the last few years, there's been some good returns. The International Meteor Association uh, had a peak of a zenithal hourly rate of about 40. When I say zenithal hourly rate, that's an optimal rate. If you were at a perfect dark sky site, with the zenith straight overhead, and you were able to watch all the way around the sky, you would expect to see 40, 20 meteors per hour. Uh, nobody has those kind of optimal conditions. There's light pollution. The moon is going to be at last quarter, so it will be up. So it will be hampering somewhat, but it's it's worth watching in the morning hours over this pet this weekend to see if you're seeing anything. The radiant for uh, northern hemisphere observers is going to be placed down in the southeast. It's going to be rising in the southeast. So. It's, uh, it's worth watching for, and as I said, it's a good primer for the Parasites, too. And why don't we give people another update just on the... Per on the is that how you say it? The Parasites? I, I say par you can say Parasites, Parasites. 
Um, I, I understand either one, so I may well be saying it wrong. But. <laughs> yeah. I, someone was mentioning they were at a Pluto conference and they they saw like heard four different pronunciations for Karen. Pluto's moon. I always think of the girl's name Karen, but yeah. it's also the mythological character is different too. So yeah, yeah. Um, right. So the per the the Perseids. Perseids, Perseids. Yeah. What's the deal? Uh, they're gonna, they are the old faithful of meteor showers. They peak uh, around mid-August. I believe it's August 13th, and the moon phase is very uh, favorable this year because the moon's going to be going uh, waxing crescent toward first quarter that week. The parasids, parasids do about 60 to 100 meteors per hour, and like I said, they're, they're pretty dependable. They always sit right about in that rate. There's never really a, a, a dud year for, for, the, for this meteor shower coming up. So... It's always worth it. It's right during the Northern Hemisphere summer when it's a good time. School's still out. You can stay up late. You can stay up early. Some of my earliest memories of astronomy when I was a kid was out watching the Perseids with my parents. Out, of course, we stayed out till about 10 or 11 at night. Um, the best time, of course, we didn't know it then, is in the morning is the best time to watch because the Earth is facing forward into its orbit. So they got that meteor stream there, and you think of a car going down the highway, you get all the bugs and mosquitoes on the front of the car. So you think of the, the car as the Earth, and the mosquitoes as the meteors. So incoming into the stream, any meteors you see before midnight, they have to catch up to the Earth from behind. And you see the difference, too, because meteors in the evening are long, slow trains. That's because they have to catch up. So you're seeing their velocity plus the Earth's velocity subtracted. Then from the morning meteors, you're seeing them head on. So you're seeing those meteors in the morning are short and quick because you're seeing the both velocities added on for the impact. So What's the source of the uh, Perseids, David? The source for this one? Oh, it's, it is... It's Temple Tuttle, isn't it? No. Oh, for the, for the Perseids. For the Perseids, it's Temple Tuttle. <laughs> I was still thinking about the Delta Aquarids. It's uh, 96 Smackholtz. It was actually the, the source of the Delta Aquarids they only discovered back in the 80s, uh, the comet. So, yeah, it's uh, for Percy, it's, it's uh, Temple Tuttle, though. So I, I, I mention this every week, and I will mention it again. Uh, take this very seriously. Organize your friends. Find a place that's going to give you dark skies. Go out. Enjoy the the meteor shower because it's oh. it's just it's the best. As you said, it is. It, this is your children will remember this and it will shape their future. This is how important this meteor next, shower is. Next week, so, I'll probably be working up a post on Universe Today. Usually, right yeah. around August, when August first, when everybody flips their calendars over, then it becomes Perseid season. So. And I have actually created an event. In, uh, in the space community for the meteor shower. So if you just go to the space community, look through the upcoming events, one of them is just the meteor shower. And, and it's not like we're going to do anything. You just click yes, you will attend, and then it'll drop it into your calendar, and you'll get a reminder when it's time to go watch them. So you can then organize your whole life it and is, build these meaningful relationships, these wonderful memories for your children. It is one of those few events you don't need a telescope, you don't need anything. You just sit out yep. there and watch. So. Telescope's not going to do you any good. Uh, okay, so uh, we last week we were talking about the return of the pale blue dot, and uh, I know Jason, you were all over that. Oh yeah, that was fantastic. Um, well, you know, I love Cassini and I love Saturn and I love just pictures from space and Mercury and Messenger and all that cool stuff, and 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 that's what this was about. And it was also about seeing uh, a vision, a picture of our planet and everybody on it, and, and all everything that was part of history of the planet Earth coalesced into one little shiny dot out there, you know, uh, seen from Saturn, seen from within our own solar system. So that's actually kind of part of the exciting thing, too. Um, anyway, this time last Friday, we were just, you know, we were anticipating Cassini's um, uh, imaging of Earth from Saturn. Now, why could it do that? Because Saturn was going to be in the way of the Sun, so uh, really, you know, a really convenient alignment. Of course, you know, it was it been all planned uh, very well where Cassini would be, um, you know, tucked behind in Saturn's shadow. So by doing that, blocks out the light from the Sun. Now, Earth can be captured as just this little uh, speck of light off in the distance, 900 million miles away. Um, now I've got a uh, let me pull up an image here. Unless you have one, Fraser, I'm not sure. Um, no, okay. I didn't. All right, so here's what we're looking at here. The image on the left-hand side is 
uh, Cassini's view of Earth. Now, if you're looking for Earth, it's not that big giant thing with the rings on it. Um, it's the tiny little blue speck that's just off in the distance beyond the hazy glow of the E-ring. Um, now, the E-ring's actually pretty cool in and of itself because that's a, uh, a, a big cloud ring of ice particles that's spewed out by Saturn's moon Enceladus, uh, and that's outside of the um, main system of rings. But anyway, beyond that, you know, another... 899.5 million miles beyond that um, is Earth, Earth and Moon, and they're they're just basically seen as that little that bright little dot. Um, now this image is a sneak preview of what Cassini of the of what the Cassini team will be making, um, in which you'll see all of Saturn backlit by the sun. It's going to be absolutely gorgeous, um, and then in that you'll just about be able to uh, pick out Earth. Um, they do have to you know, make some level adjustments, and I say that because I'm a Photoshop user, they have to make some adjustments to brighten Earth and to brighten some of the features. It, uh, otherwise, it, Earth isn't as visible as shown in this, in this image. But that's typical when, uh, when we're talking about astronomical images. Any image processor um, worth his salt is going to fix an image, is going to process an image in some way, shape, or form. Um, that's just how it works. So before people get all angry and go, oh, you know, they're lying to us. No, this is a real image, and, and, and that's us from 900 million miles away. On the other side of that is the view of Earth and Moon from Mercury. So we're going to the, you know, the other side of the solar system, heading towards the sun, another, uh, let's see, 61 million miles away. Mercury, the first spacecraft to orbit, I mean, Messenger, the first spacecraft to orbit Mercury, turned its cameras our direction because it's looking for moons of Mercury that we may not know about. Um, Earth just so happened to be in that view the same day Cassini was taking the view, uh, was taking its images. So there we go, Earth from both sides of the solar system, um, visible as a tiny little point of light. So. Cool. Classic. I mean, I mean, that's the, that's about as awesome as it comes. I mean, you know, seeing views of our solar system from these spacecraft is is awesome. Seeing us from their point of view as we're looking at images coming back from them is ten times more awesome. So uh, it's it's always neat to have a perspective on on what we look like from within our own solar system. And I say that repeatedly because it is still within our own solar system. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're not looking at Earth from another star. We're not looking at Earth from, you know, another part of the galaxy or another galaxy. You, you can't do that. I mean, Earth almost disappears from well within our own solar system. So it just gives you a sense of the scale of how big it really is out there. Um, the, the, famous, uh, the famous pale blue dot image that was taken back in February 1990, that was taken from uh, the point of view of Voyager as it left, as it passed the orbit of Pluto. And, I mean, you could barely make out Earth in that image, um, which is what inspired Carl Sagan to, you know, do his, his whole famous pale blue dot uh, uh, soliloquy there um, in, in Cosmos, in the original Cosmos. And um, the, the six most poignant words there is, that's here, that's home, that's us. So when you look at these images, you're looking at, at everything that ever was on planet Earth. Right. Yeah. Uh, and there was a great, uh, you know, people are noting, yeah, that everyone who's ever lived, ever died is in that photograph. Mm -hmm. But what I think is is great, there was another photograph, I'm just going to segue a little bit here, we've got Apollo 11, which also had its uh, sort of anniversary, anniversary on the weekend, yeah. right, for what's 40... 44th? 44th? And Viking... And Viking one. And Viking, yeah. And so you, you had this, you had this picture, and Phil actually did a great job of it. He was like, you know, in this picture, there's a picture of the of the lander going down to the surface of the moon, and you had Earth in the background, and essentially everyone on Earth and Buzz Aldrin and uh, Neil Armstrong were in that picture. There was just, you know, one person who wasn't in that photograph. Mike, right? Fun. Right. Yeah, which, been... yeah, who was taking the picture yeah. from from the spacecraft, which was great. So one human being 
was not in that picture. <laughs> Everybody else was in that there's, picture. when you're left out. When I was writing an article last year, I uh, found out there's very few pictures of Neil Armstrong on the moon, on the surface. There's one or two. He was, you're going to see him in the reflection in Buzz's he was, visor. Yeah, he was taking most of the pictures, so he, they yeah. didn't, they, he didn't get... There's one or two that exists of him outside during the EBA on the moon. Yeah, and I think those are taken by the 16 millimeter camera that was mounted on the um, that was mounted on the lander. Um, yeah. You know, as far as all the good Hasselblad stuff, he took most of those. You know, because yeah. um, uh, so, some some have said it's because well he got to be first on the moon, so he had to take all the pictures of Buzz doing stuff. <laughs> and, but Buzz said he was just a better photographer. <laughs> and you can imagine how difficult it was to actually take those pictures on the surface of the moon. I mean, it's, I can imagine. Yeah, it's you can't like, look through the camera. So they yeah, you can't. Train. You can't look through you know, the camera. Kind of looking like that. You know? The the exposure is just like it's. There's no soft light. Is just the harshest light. You know, you've got to get that film that's, into the camera, and oh, it was just been. That, that's can you what imagine how much training they must have done to work that, with those cameras. That's what drives a lot of the moon landing deniers. One of their better arguments that they'll put forth is they'll say, well, there's no stars in the background on the photo, but it's because the exposure time was too short. You wouldn't see stars anyway. Yeah, so. right. yeah that's photography 101, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Unless, they, unless they were doing HDR photography, then uh, it was not yeah, going to work. Well, they had the T6i from the future that got sent back. <laughs> right. And... That's all alien technology. Yeah, alien technology. <laughs> so, okay, so I've got one one last thing here, and I'm just, I know none of you worked on this. Nancy worked on this, but it's just an update. We've been talking quite a bit about Kepler, the Kepler mission. Of course, this is the uh, spacecraft that's been searching for extrasolar planets, and its reaction wheels have gone down, and nobody listens to me that you got to take more reaction wheels. <laughs> 12 reaction wheels is the bare minimum for any future <laughs> spacecraft, I think. So, so they're down to two reaction reactionary. wheels. Both of them are malfunctioning, and they've been doing a bunch of tests in the last week. And uh, they've been able to get both reaction wheels going uh, in both directions, but one has got... They've, they've both got one of them friction. doesn't go in both directions. Yeah. Yeah. One one goes in right. Sorry, one is going both directions. One is going in one direction, but there's friction, and so ultimately there's only so much they're going to be able to to get this to move. So so maybe we're going to get a little more science out of this spacecraft when they thought it was dead dead, but uh, but it's not doomsday yeah, this... for Kepler just yet. I mean, because I've seen I've seen both sets of, of articles really kind of depending on how you take the news. You know, if you read the, if you read the updates from the Kepler team uh, and you can go, oh, well, Kepler's not working. Or you can go, well, they may be able to get Kepler working. So, I'm, you know, w what's going to happen really depends on, on uh, a lot of this friction test because it needs three wheels to, to operate. It has four. One of the wheels they got to spin both ways again, which, which it has to do. The other one, um, it can only go one way, but it, it does have to do with the friction. So I think they're, up, they're, they're back to friction testing and seeing how much, uh, I guess, what vibration they're going to actually uh, get off of that. And Because um, if they get too much, they can't focus for a long period of time, which is what Kepler needs to do to find yeah. exoplanets. Yeah, and this really requires very precise... Tar you know, targeting. It's not like you can just go and turn it and get a vast swath of the sky. You need to really focus in and get these the the right planets, the right stars at the right time. Yeah, yep. I Kepler's only looking at a segment too, and uh, along the Cygnus, along the galactic plane, Cygnus, Hercules, and Lyra, Lyra right at that intersection. They they really need another Kepler. There's tests coming in 2017. Tests will be a little different, but yeah, no, I know, but it almost feels like they should just take Kepler, just rebuild it, launch another one, like you know, improve on it a bit, but just get another one up there. It's too bad the terrestrial planet finder that they shelved. Oh, don't awesome get me started. On that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, How do you, you know, feel about that, Fraser? Yeah. Oh. Hey, you know what would be great? Answering the most fundamental question that human beings can actually ask which is, are we alone in the universe? And that's the spacecraft that would do it. And it got canceled. So, uh, <laughs> um, right. Okay, well, I think, we're, I think we've kind of wrapped up all the big stories that we wanted to talk about. Uh, Curiosity did its longest drive this week, which was great. So it's been, it's Yay. catching up fast to the, uh, to Opportunity and Spirits records. Uh, yeah, it's gonna be it. a while before it before it bypasses. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, there's like yeah. they got a yeah. ten year head start, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, cool. Okay, so uh, well, let's wrap this up. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Now, uh, David Dickinson, where can people find more about you? Let's see. This week I've been active on Universe Today, my own site, Astro Guys with a Z. I've been active on Canada.com, of course. And, see, I've written uh, also on Listasaur. I have several posts over there. And I have an awesome post on everything you'd want to know about the history of Vulcan, searching for Vulcan and Vulcanoids coming out this Sunday on Universe Today. So I put a lot of work into that. It's a great post. Jason Major. I'm at lightsinthedark.com. Uh, I also write for Universe Today, Discovery Space News, and you can find me on Twitter at JP Major. Um, if you jump over to my website, lightsinthedark.com, you can enter to win a DVD of PBS, uh, the PBS Nova special, Meteor Strike. Uh, this goes into detail about the Chelyabinsk uh, meteor that, that exploded over Russia back in February and uh, talks about Tunguska and um, where the Chelyabinsk meteor came from and all sorts of really neat stuff. So that was an uh, uh, excellent show. Uh, I've got some of these to give away, so jump over there and enter the contest. They turned that around really quickly. They, they had that they they had were, on they, TV. It was like within... that thing flashed through the sky, and they had, and they had guys from, uh, the, let's see, San Diego National that. That Labs. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, like within two weeks, I think they had a show on it. It was amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know what? And, and, I mean, it was really good. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I thought it was great. I love Noah. Yeah. Uh, all right, Scott Lewis, where do we find out more? Um, I'm at knowthecosmos.com. On Twitter, I'm Bald Astronomer, the virtual star party coming up on Sunday, where mm, Sunday. some guy I, I work with. Yeah, we he, hope. We hope. Have, and some other guy, he has his telescope Clear in Florida. Clear skies. Um, so, yeah, I'm there, and I'm also doing a lot of Hangouts with Space Telescope Science Institute with the Hubble Hangouts. So we have one coming up in, I believe, two and a half weeks. And to find out more about Hubble and Comet Ison, go to hubblesite.org slash go slash Ison. Right on. Cool. All right. So and you can, of course, check out everything I'm doing on Universe Today. You can also go, and if you're watching this right now and you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. Just trying to think it's there. Anyway, yeah, click subscribe if you want to get uh, updates. And also I'm recording uh, a couple of uh, explainers on space every week. So if you've got some questions about space and astronomy, hit me up and we'll try and add that to the queue. So, all right, well, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks to the uh, panelists for joining us this week. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you all next week on the Weekly Later. Space Hangout. Take care. Bye, everyone.